and get started with uh, our score intro. I'll give a few more folks a chance to join us, and um, but I want to stay on time. So I want to welcome you all to How to Ensure Your Website is Your Workhorse. We have uh, four great presenters with us today, and I believe they're going to introduce themselves a little bit. We have Gail, Steve, Phil, and, and Robin. Um, and like I said, they're going to uh, share a little bit about their background um, as we um, move forward. I do want to talk about score first. And uh, SCORE offers a couple different things to folks that are uh, thinking about starting a small business or in the process of starting that business or already are in business. Uh, we work with the whole range. Um, we offer training. We have a uh, several great training opportunities uh, this week yet. Um, and then we will be restarting again in January. Uh, the most important thing that SCORE does, however, is the mentoring. Our mentoring is free and confidential. Our mentors are volunteers that have lots of different experiences and um, expertise and knowledge that they want to share with others. Uh, SCORE is a national organization, so if we need to reach out beyond our chapter, beyond our district, we have that national profile to go to should we not be able to fill your needs locally, but that rarely happens because we have a lot of really great mentors right here. Um, a lot of folks ask me, what is a mentoring session like and where do I have to be in my, in my business process to get a mentor? Uh, you don't have to have done anything yet. You just have to have questions. Uh, you, you do not have to have your business license. You do not have to have um, any of those base things covered yet. Uh, just as long as you've got questions, we're here to help. Again, uh, we also help businesses that are already in business and they have questions about the gamut, finances, marketing, you name it. Uh, sessions, at least for that first session, usually are in that 30 to 45 minute mark. Um, they will be a sharing of, you know, what you, what, who you are, what your goals are, and that SCORE mentor will help come up with some sort of plan to help keep you on track and keep you moving forward. And you can keep working with that mentor or oftentimes they'll bring in other mentors to fill in um, gaps as your needs change. So how do I get a mentor? That's super, super easy. You can go to the websites listed here and I will throw those in chat real quick. Um, you can also put a note in chat and just say, hey, I'd like to meet with a mentor and I'll make sure the right chapter reaches out to you. Uh, if you don't go to these websites for a mentor, uh, go to find uh, all the great information we have on these websites. They're super robust. There's tons of templates, uh, little short programs, um, presentations, information, just for about anything you, any subject you can even imagine. So I strongly encourage you to check that out. Uh, we do expect a decent crowd today, so uh, questions will be handled thusly. We will do them at the end, and we ask that if you would like a question asked to our presenter to put it in the Q&A tab. Um, they tend to get lost in chat. You can use chat for everything else, but if you have a question you want asked out loud to the presenters, try and put it in that Q&A tab, and we will address them at uh, the very end of our presentation today. So I'm going to go ahead and um, pull my share down, and I'm going to turn it over to our uh, lovely group today. Go ahead. Great. Are we good? Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, welcome, everyone, and happy holidays. And I want to thank Teresa and Square Boston for having us here today um, and, and thank my fellow panelists for joining me. And I hope you're as excited as we are to talk about how to ensure your website is your workhorse. So our goal with the, work, with the workshop today was to pull together a, a panel of experts on a variety of website topics so you can learn from each of them about their best practices, um, their particular area of expertise, and also have the opportunity at the end, as Teresa mentioned, to ask some questions. Next slide. So who will be presenting today? We have Phil McCormick, who's the owner of Phil McCormick Design Works. 
We have Robin Clapp, who's the owner of Web Design by Robin. We have Steve Almeida, the owner of Almeida and Associates. And then we have me, Gail Snow Moraski. I'm the owner of Results Communications and Research. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to share that um, a while back I wrote a blog post called why just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. And that was a reference to um, the movie Field of Dreams. And just because you put this beautiful website out there, it can end up being an island to it, onto itself. And, and in fact, I use an island image in the blog post because many people will take the time and energy to build a beautiful blog, blog post. I mean, a beautiful website, but if it's just sitting out there and no one can find it, it's kind of just out there on its own. So today we really want to get into the whys and what's of having a really effective online presence, particularly with your website. And then we're also going to get into a lot of the hows. So the hows are the actual tactics, like um, what our experts are going to share that you can take action on to ensure that your website is as effective as possible and presents you as well as possible. So you're going to learn why your web website needs to both reflect your organization and resident your target audiences, why you need to provide for an exceptional user experience. You probably all heard the term UX, that stands for user experience. And Google puts a lot of weight on that as far as deciding what websites to serve up. We're going to talk about what actions do you most want visitors to take on your site. And the desired actions that you want visitors to take on your site are called conversions. So we'll be talking about that. And then also why it's important to ensure your site is optimized for search at launch. So um, SEO or search engine optimization tactics. Next slide. So um, just for fun and to get, every, get and keep everybody in the holiday mode, um, throughout our presentation, we're gonna be referring to winter light. So um, keep your eyes and ears open for um, discussions about websites that promote winter light displays and events. Next slide. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Phil McCormick, who's gonna talk about design strategies and how to put your best foot forward. Great, thanks. Good afternoon. Thanks again for joining us. Um, so that you can make the most of your website, as Gail mentioned, the four of us are each gonna present areas of expertise based on research, best practices, and our own individual experience. So we'll start with how to put your best foot forward from the visual and user experience perspective. For potential customers that have found you through a search engine or been given your URL, your website is your brand. Your brand is not just your logo, a business card, the colors used, or a physical representation of your business. It is the entire client experience, how clients interact with your business, how they're treated, and how they feel about your business. Your website's the critical extension of your brand. It's what information is presented, how it looks, how it functions, its security, how it comes up in searches, and the user experience should be informative, rewarding, and beneficial. Throughout the presentation, we will review both good and bad examples of websites to show you the difference. Here we have some of the most visited consumer sites. They're carefully designed for both their returning and potential customers, and their goal is to always be relevant. These sites keep you engaged with their brand, their information or marketing tactics, and they have common themes and practices. Some of these you can easily use on your website. Why do you need a well-designed site? Well, your site's competing with every other site out there, including the ones that we just saw. You want the audience to be able to easily navigate through pages and find the information they're looking for. The most important messages to communicate are the benefits of your business or your products to the consumer. Make it clear how you will make your prospective client's life better. I can't stress this enough. Your message should be how you will make their life easier, more enjoyable, and their experience better. A well-designed site immediately presents your brand in an attractive and functional manner, manner, allows the viewer to find what they're looking for and inherently builds trust and creates loyalty in your business. 
So as you know, when you're looking at a site, you literally have milliseconds to look the part and engage your audience. Here's what not to do. This is angren.net. They sell new technology and gadgets. When you look at this site, it's like, where do you begin? What is their message? What are they trying to communicate? It's unorganized, it's cluttered. Up in the right-hand corner, top right, you see an electric Porsche. And on the same page, you see a, a lawnmower on the bottom left. This is a throw everything against the wall and see what sticks approach, which is the opposite of a very targeted approach that smart companies use. So what you wanna do is start with a clean design. Keep it simple, less is more. Too many elements are distracting and make it difficult to focus on content and the message. Make sure it's relative and engaging and use vacant space, areas free of visual content so viewers are able to easily find and process information. Only use content that supports your message. So here's an example of a site that Robin and I are working on. This is AppTech Graphics. On the left is a close-up of the home page as you would see it in a browser. The colors, the typeface, and all the elements support and extend their brand for consistency. You can see there's lots of white space so your eye can move around the website and process the visuals and choose where you want to go next. People are going to be looking for different things, so you want to be able, you want to set it up so they're able to find what it is they're looking for. As an example here, the hero image will rotate and highlight their main products and services. Below that are the three print categories that you can choose from, from app tep graphics. Below that are the client testimonials. And then if you look on the right-hand side, you can see here on the um, why choose app tep graphics, and they're giving you the, their benefits to their clients or consumers. All these elements intentionally designed to allow the audience to easily find what they're looking for. Here we have the world's worst website. This is a tongue in cheek example of what not to do. So I'd like you to take a mental picture of this. Look at all the colors, the different typefaces, the imagery. They have the links at the bottom where the navigation is, the graphics. It's very unorganized, very disjointed and not something that you're gonna to wanna to do on your website. What you wanna do instead is you wanna establish a visual hierarchy. You wanna use a strong visual hierarchy through placement, size, and color. It's important to keep in mind that viewers read in either an F or Z pattern. That is, they start across the top of the page and that's where your most important information should be. And then they scan down either down the left side or they'll go across and do a Z to the bottom left corner and then shoot across, okay? You want size, the bigger elements to be seen first. These are the cues that you wanna give. Another cue is color. The best thing to do is use the 60, 30, 10 rule where you have 60% is the main color, which should be neutral, toned down, 30% for the secondary color, and then 10% for the accent color. This is meant to have vibrancy and grab the reader's attention. So in this captive advantage website, it follows the F and Z pattern for reading. The logo and tagline are at the top and prominent so you know right away what they're about. The navigation is easily detected. We use red to call out the features. There's the homepage, messaging and important information are in red as well. There's lots of white space so your eyes can easily move around the page and it meets expectations of the user experience. That's something important to keep in mind. So for example, the underlined blue text that you see in the third paragraph, people are used to being able to click on those to find more information about topics. And then below that is the contact us button, which is um, the call to action. And that's easily seen. Consistency is key. Your elements should all be consistent throughout the site. That means your typography, your colors, your graphics, and your images. Your headlines, subheads, text, buttons, they should be the same from one page to the next. You don't want to jump around with the look and feel of your site. And a good advice that I always give is don't use more than two, two typefaces. Like if you think back to that last 
or rather the world's worst website, how they had all different typefaces. It just makes it hard for people to um, take in the information. And you also want to establish a color palette and stick with it. So we did a little research on winter lights and this website did the best job at having a, a sub page about winter lights. You can see here they're using consistent headlines, sub headlines, copy colors and graphics. It all allows the viewer to quickly understand the context of every page and what they're viewing. Vacant space is intentionally used to isolate content for quick scanning of the entire page. On each page, there's one message being communicated and everything on that page supports and reinforces the messaging. One of the things that happens a lot is clients that I work with, they wanna do a bunch of different messages on one page. And I always tell them not to do that because you, do, you just, you don't get it across. You wanna focus on one thing and you can see here, the sub pages that lead you to the winter lights and how that page just totally focuses on winter lights. So the use of clear messaging, all of your content, words, images, graphics should be conveying one message to the viewer. Do you have what they need? Can you solve their problem? What are the benefits of you using your services or products? What regions do you service? Gail will have some great insight on this with the SEO. And then you want to set appropriate expectations. So here's the opposite of clear messaging. This is the Paradise Water website. They have 10 different statements all competing for your attention, along with this confusing blend of images. What not to do. And then here we have global properties services. And this is another site that Robin and I develop. And this focuses on their commitment to co customer service. This is seen right at the top with the testimonials that are in the changing banner. And then below that is the mission and philosophy statement of the company. They want their audience to know how important they are to them. From there, they feature their four areas of services in the boxes below. What you want to do when you're doing a website is maximize your call to action. They need to clearly define what you want the web visitor to do. Because your business is unique with your own processes, you need to use call to actions that work specifically for you. The most often used is schedule a free consultation, which gives them a chance to kick the tires. Other secondary actions are there to build trust. If a viewer wants to learn more before scheduling a free consultation, you should have more calls to action on the website so they can learn more about your business and your products. And those calls to action should be conspicuous. Use colorful buttons or icons. And here's what not to do. This is Link's car. And you know, the first thing you see is I am Ling, you can trust me. Really? Where do you go next? How do you find what to do? The only apparent call to action button I can see is under the header and it says stop. On this contact page, it's made as easy as possible for people to find their way around and navigate. It gives the audience four ways to take action. The first one is the phone number up in the top left, which is highlighted. And if you have a dynamic site, which Robin will talk about in her um, segment, they'll be able to just call from the um, smartphone. There's an email address, which would bring up your mail, and then there's a contact form, which you can fill out. And then beyond that is another um, call to action button and arrange a look back. So these are the ways that you want it to look good. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Robin Clapp of Web Design by Robin. Thank you, Phil, and hello, everyone. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, making your website custom, responsive, content manageable, and secure. Next slide. All right, website security is all about being responsible and taking measures to make sure your website is safe for those who are visiting it. So every time you enter a website and view a padlock right to the left of the URL, this means that the website is secure. And you may think this only applies to online shopping websites that collect your credit card information for payment, but it's not true. It applies to all websites. It's about security. 
This may seem a little too technical right now, but I'm gonna go into it because it's worth the lesson if it helps you to protect your privacy while online and those of your customers. There is an S in HTTPS and S stands for secure. And when you enter a website where there is no S, it's just HTTP. The website you visit and all the data sent over the connection is in the clear. Anyone can see it. Uh, nothing is private. When an SSL certificate is installed on your website, it adds an extra layer of security and this creates an encrypted connection. It protects your website's privacy, the website visitor's privacy. And any information shared between the website visitor and the website is now encrypted. And all the traffic in the website is now directed through the HTTPS. Furthermore, you can click on that little padlock and learn all about the SSL certificate and its protections if you wanna make sure that a website is secure. Next slide. In 2018, Google decided that protecting the privacy of those browsing the internet was super important. In fact, it is so important that it was going to present a warning to anyone entering a non-secure website. Furthermore, if your business website is not secure, and I see a lot of them out there, um, your website's Google ranking will be negatively affected. And Gail will go into that and many other um, ways your Websites can be negatively affected by Google um, further on in the presentation. Are you turning away customers? Let's face it, your customers are using Google to find you, whether you know it or not. It's how they look for websites they want to visit, but it's also how they look for them when they want to return to a website. They're just lazy. They're plugging it in Google and it's coming up. So Google is the gateway. If Google warns you or your customers to steer clear of a website, you're probably going to do that. Um, so make sure you protect yourself, your customers, the integrity of your business by making your business website secure. And if you take away anything from my portion of this presentation today, take away this. Secure your website by installing that SSL certificate so that you always have the HTTPS and that padlock is showing. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about responsive website design. How does your website look on a desktop, on a tablet, on a laptop, on a mobile, and why is this important? 40% of your customers, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, are visiting your small business websites on their mobile devices. Let's face it, people are using voice detection to ask their phones questions. Siri, find where I can see Christmas lights on display. Or Siri, outdoor holiday light show near me, right? We're all doing it. Um, your customers are on the go and they wanna find you on the fly. And this means they are using their phones to visit business websites. So make it easy for them to do business with you. New slide. Keep your website content current. I might be aging myself a little bit here, but when I first started designing websites, they were coded in HTML only. And if you wanted to update your website content, you needed to know how to code. This all changed with the introduction of content management systems, also referred to as CMS. And I've listed um, the one that I use exclusively, which is Joomla. Having your website designed in a content management system allows you to easily log into your website, make changes to your content, in a very safe and easy environment. This lets you do it. This lets you do it yourself. So you're doing it when you want to do it on your schedule, and it's a lot more affordable not having to go back to someone um, who knows how to code, right? So save time, save money. So if you have a business website that you can modify the content on, I highly recommend that you do the following. Remove content that is no longer relevant or correct, old prices, wrong business hours, items on your menu that you no longer offer, because this just frustrates your customers. Furthermore, make sure your copyright date is listed as the current year. When I see a website with a copyright of 2012, I wonder, are they really still in business? Okay, almost done. One more section left for me. And this one is website maintenance. 
The best way to keep your website healthy over time is to have your website designer maintain your website. As an example, I'm listing what I offer in my maintenance plan. I monitor my websites 24 seven. I'm the first one notified if a website goes down. I do website backups just in case we ever need them. We've got those backups. Software updates. This is probably the most important thing um, and guarantee to fix anything that stops working. A healthy relationship with your website designer ensures that your small business website will continue to serve you well for years to come because there's nothing worse than spending money to invest in a website, paying the website designer, and then never seeing them again, right? Yes, your website might be beautiful and functional and working flawlessly, um, but wait a year and it will be hacked because it never got the ongoing security patches and the updates that it needed. Those are those software updates. Website maintenance is the number one way to ensure your investment in a website. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about communication strategies, how to supercharge your website. And I'd like to introduce Stephen Almeida. Thank you, Robin. Now I'm going to continue our trip to the winter lights with a fun discussion about IT. <laughs> Let's jump right in as we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time. Next slide, please. Uh, what does IT have to do with web design? To some, web projects are a start or to a new business, or others, the revitalization of an existing business. You may be looking to attract new class customers or transition into new markets. What better time to look at some of your internal business functions than right now? Some of these functions can improve the process, functionality, or reach of your business while adding value to your web project. This may also be a great time to make sure you're meeting your regulatory requirements. All of us in Massachusetts need to follow the MA20 CMR17 data security requirement, uh, which with Robin's uh, backup and making sure software is updated, helps you maintain that. While additionally, some of us may need to adhere to HIPAA, SOX, or FINRA requirements to name just a few of the alphabet soup groups out there watching us. Knowing in the early stages of your web design may also lead to a better overall project that provides answers to the following key aspects of your business. Today, I'll touch a bit on your branding, email, and secure information transfer. Next slide, please. So like Phil said earlier, when most of us think about branding, it's usually logos, color, letterhead, and the best swag we all get to have uh, and, and play around with. You have spent a great deal of time and money creating what is a great visual statement. These are all important elements. So why waste this effort by not using your domain email address on the website and in our day-to-day -day business operations? This will help reinforce your brand and it instills a great deal more confidence in your business to clients and prospects. Many studies have shown that using free accounts reduce the impact and may lead prospects to then think you're not a viable business. Emails not, not all email is created equally. Using a professional email solution will improve your productivity and improve access to your information, such as messages, contacts, calendar entries, and notes. A carefully selected solution will help even the solopreneur improve productivity and sanity. You'll not have to double enter information on your devices or potentially miss a meeting because the calendar item is on the laptop, but not on your phone. And who amongst us hasn't had that happen at one point or another? The free solutions open the door to missed messages, unread, unreadable messages, and potential for non-compliance. Um, your messages will be open to scrutiny by a third party if you use the freebie options. Remember, they're free, so you and your data become the cost. Also using some low cost providers or your host email offerings may not be the best solution either. Often these options are just an add-on to their primary service. Their staff is usually not the most technical and their technology tends to be outdated. This may open, up, open you up to various attacks or threats. Your messages may be blocked or flagged as spam 
And many of us don't ever spec check that spam folder, so missing some key opportunities. Lastly, our communication could be delayed by slow or non-responsive solutions. Remember, you can never get that second first impression. Plan accordingly. Next slide, please. So, uh, oh, next one, sorry. I missed the next slide. <laughs> um, plan your forms carefully. You should spend some time, review what data you are going to be asking for on your slide. Review what will make your form a success, what elements are critical to you, and be careful what information you're asking for. Social security numbers, tax IDs, et cetera, should never be part of a request in these forms because most forms are sent over email and are technically unprotected. What makes the process as simple as, we want to make the process as simple as possible for your clients or prospects. If it's not too complicated, or, or sorry, sorry, if it is too it complicated, is too or you don't get the information you need, then you may have wasted an opportunity, or at the very least, you've wasted some valuable time. Maybe you need more than just a simple form. Review your business needs. Do you need to access more than just name, phone number, and email address? Most forms, like I said, are sent over email, so be wary what you're asking for. Uh, also, you might need to request your clients, vendors, or staff to send over large files. Well, email wasn't created for large file transfer. Most, uh, it was originally just created just to send uh, messages. They will bog down the service, cause delays and potentially crashes, not just for you, but potentially for your entire organization. You may also be exposing critical data to the prying eyes. We have worked with accountants, lawyers, and real estate agents, to name a few, that require additional information to better serve their customers. They may need tax forms, completed applications, or legal documents sent back and forth. These should never be sent via email uh, or, or via unsecured email. So using a secure synchronization or secure cloud storage tool will change the way you do business. You can receive any size file as it doesn't go through the email system. You can access via secure web solutions to receive these files, so thus keeping your email free and clear. This way you increase your efficiency, remain compliant, and cut down on the possibility of cyber attacks on either your website or email services, email service hindering your business. These solutions can be incorporated into your website, again, leveraging brand and improving your SEO. Next slide, please. As you can see off to the right, we have an example of a mutual client Robin and I have. He was having a tough time getting documents from clients. A lot of times he was making trips out to the client's homes uh, to get the data. So we set up a page on his website where their client, staff, or vendors can go and enter their credentials. Once the credentials are entered, they can upload or download their tax related items and not worry about security or our information going missing. They can access securely from their desktop, tablet, smartphone. Sorry, the flip phone won't help you much here. In addition to security, you can improve your functionality by having different members of your staff have access to the data without slowing down the process you get to manage the workflow, not, not rely on the website or the web host. These are just some highlights as of how an IP, IT person working with your web designer, graphic artist, and SEO person can add some robust solutions without breaking the bank. In the end, by doing so, you will probably add many more productive hours to your week. Now, I'd love, love to introduce Gail to help you understand your SEO and how to improve your website's results. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I noticed someone already put a question in the chat about um, why their website isn't being found on search. And um, that's what we're gonna be talking about um, in my portion of the presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you can build a beautiful new website um, just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. You have to make sure your website is situated so that Google views it as a credible, reputable site and is willing to drive traffic to it um, based on what Google is witnessing when it visits your website. Um, next slide. 
So today's webinar, um, we're going to be focusing on the tasks that support your website ranking well organically versus via what's called page search tactics. Um, we're going to be focusing on having um, an organic listing um, to your website that appears in search results, appear high up in Google. Uh, any of the tactics we talk about are still going to be relevant to other search engines like Bing and Yahoo, but the, given that 92% of individuals use Google as their primary search engine, um, we'll be referencing Google and ranking well in Google. Next slide. So um, we're going to be going over, oh, I'm sorry, can you go back? I'm sorry. Back to the back, one slide back. Um, okay. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, what is SEO? Um, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization, and it's the practice of making sure that your website appears as high up in search results as possible. And I always say as high up in search results as possible for your products, services, and solutions to problems that you offer. So you always need to give some thought to what are the pain points that your website or your business addresses for your audience? Because many people don't just search on the product or service you offer. They don't even necessarily know um, what product or service would solve their problems or how to refer to it. And so they're just searching for a solution to their problems. So you wanna rank well for how and why and where and what terms as much as you do for the products and services that you offer. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there's two different type of tactics or ways that you can rank well in uh, search results for relevant terms. So getting back to our, our winter lights example, you'll see on the left-hand side, uh, when someone typed winter lights into Google, there's what's called an organic listing there. So um, you don't see any indication that it's an ad, but Google is calling up information that it pulls from the website. And there's a link there um, to get to the website itself. And then on the right-hand side, what you see is what's called the Google ad or a paid search ad. And it's also referred to as SEM or search engine marketing and even pay per click. But that's an example of someone an advertiser paying and running a Google ad so that their uh, website will appear up high in results in search um, for the term in question. And you can buy Google ads so that your ad appears in the top four spots on a page or the bottom four spots on a page. So many advertisers and um, companies that are in competitive environments, particularly when their uh, competitors are running ads, end up needing to run ads just so they can appear on the first four stops, first four spots um, in Google search results. Next slide. So um, Robin and um, Phil and Steve, um, I think we're on the wrong slide. Um, yes, here we go. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, so Robin and, and Steve and Phil already addressed a little bit about this. Um, Robin in particular talked about the need to make sure um, your site is secure. Therefore you have what's known as an SSL certificate. Um, Google does not like to serve up websites that are not secure. So if your site is insecure, um, you're, you're not gonna drive a lot of traffic to it. Google certainly not gonna do it on your behalf. You need your site to load quickly, and that all, you know, is something that a technical person um, involved with your site or your developer can help with. But you need your site to load click quickly. It needs to be secure, um, and it also has to be what we were talking about before, responsive to other devices. So um, it should be very um, easy to read and use on a, on a, a mobile device, you know, as much as it is on a laptop or desktop. In fact, Google um, basically um, prioritizes mobile or local search over other searches. So it's very critical that your site um, appear well on a, a mobile device. So those are some of the, the, um, the critical SEO tactics um, that you need to keep in mind. But now we're going to talk about um, three other 
really crucial ones. And one of the tactics is conducting keyword research and making sure um, that you understand um, what terms your target audiences are using to find you for. And we're gonna be talking about that in detail in a minute. But those keyword then help inform various behind the scenes um, page title tags and your website content and your page headers. Um, the other thing you need to do is make sure you have what's called a Google My Business profile or um, what Google is now referring to as a Google search and maps listing. And that's really critical too. And sometimes businesses that aren't local um, and they're more national or regional or they don't have like a storefront might say to themselves, well, I don't really need to have a Google My Business profile. But I encourage all organizations to have one because ultimately having a Google My Business profile does um, influence how you rank overall or globally. And then the third tactic listed here is um, making sure that you have what I call a geographic statement or description on your site. And I say, ideally you'd house it um, in the footer of your website because Google crawls and indexes your site. And it's really up to you to tell Google what geography uh, you're located in and the geography of the audiences you serve. I always say Google is not an interpreter. It, Google is not a mind reader. Google just index and crawls your site and takes information from it. So if you're not telling Google um, what your site is all about, um, Google is not gonna make a leap of faith. Next slide. So why is keyword research the key to SEO success? Um, so a keyword is basically, it can be a one word, thing, a one word term, it can be a phrase. A keyword is basically um, what someone puts into a search engine to identify someone who offers a product, services, or solutions to problems that you offer. And it's, I always say it's the most important and first SEO tactic because if you don't know what terms people are using to find you, um, how is your website going to rank well? And um, you know, people tend to put blinders on about their own business. So, you know, you can become very internally focused when you have your own site and you know what words you use to describe your services and your coworkers use. Um, you might start using acronyms and things like that, but you really need to walk in the on the shoes of your target audience as lay people. And keyword research really helps you figure out what terms are people using to find someone like you. And also, are people even searching? Because if people aren't searching, and sometimes they're not, then you need a totally different approach to marketing. And then you may not want to put as much time and energy into making your site rank well for search. Next slide. So here's some examples of keywords or search terms that I would like my business results, communications, and research to rank well in Google for. So digital marketing agency, SEO company, SEO expert, help with organic SEO, and how can I make my site rank better in Google? So again, the, some of these terms I found out about um, for doing keyword research for my own company. I didn't know that people often search on SEO company, but it's, it's the number one phrase they use to, use to identify somebody that's an SEO specialist. Next slide. So we talked about keyword research briefly and keyword research is really going through the process of identifying what terms your target audiences are using to identify someone that offers the product services and solution to problems you offer. And what's really beneficial about keyword research is that you can conduct it for a specific geography. So if you only offer services in Massachusetts, it's really helpful to understand, well, what are people um, searching on in Massachusetts. Um, and then on top of it, sometimes there's regional differences and jargon and terms used. So it's really important to conduct the keyword research in the geography that you serve. And keyword research helps you figure out the average number of times a month someone is putting um, one of these keywords or search terms into Google because I've often found people, people get ideas in their head about what terms people are using most, 
Um, and then the keyword research will reveal some something altogether different. So you never want to make assumptions about the terms that people are using to find you. You really want to do the research so that you're making sure your, your site um, contains those terms in your content and in your behind the scenes tags. Next slide. So before you begin your keyword research, you really need to think about your target audiences. How many do you have? And would they all be searching the same way? And particularly if you serve both businesses and consumers, they probably wouldn't be searching the same way. So you really want to walk in their shoes. Um, we're not going to go into um, complete detail on how to use a keyword planner tool, but you do when you're going to be using a keyword planner tool, you have to come up with what I call an input list. So a keyword planner tool will help generate thousands more terms um, that might be appropriate for your business, but you really need to come up with the original input list to put in the tool. So you need to be thinking about um, what your various target audiences might be searching on related to the products and services you offer. Like we discussed earlier, you have to finalize the geography you want to conduct your research in. And then you really need to think about, do you have the time and the comfort level to conduct the research yourself? Or should you hire a digital marketing agency or an SEO specialist or consultant to help you with that? Um, next slide. So um, there's some free tools you can do to con use to conduct keyword research. And then there's some um, low cost ones. So the tool that I use the most um, to conduct keyword research for my clients is the Google Ads Keyword Planner tool. And that's because that one allows you to conduct a search uh, in a specific geography. And I really feel, as I mentioned earlier, that it's important to conduct your research in the geography that you serve. Um, but um, you do have to have a Google Ads account and you can set up a Google Ads account for free, but you do need to have one in order to use that tool to conduct the keyword research. Otherwise, you can use a tool called um, you can use a tool called uh, Keywords Everywhere, and it's an add-on you can add on to your Chrome or Firefox browser. But with that, you do have to buy credits, and every time you want to download um, a certain set of terms, like maybe you put something in to test it, like um, I put an SEO specialist and it'll come up with a list of five other terms that are similar to SEO specialists. You do have to use your credits to then get the, the volumes for those terms. And like I said, it's called Keywords Everywhere because it looks at search behavior everywhere. Anybody in Google that's entering something, yeah, um, related to the keyword, it's not ge geography specific. Next slide. So how are you going to use your final keyword research? And um, what I tend to do is just download all the data. So when you use, um, particularly if you use a keyword planner tool like Google Ads, it will let you download the results into an Excel document or um, uh, into a Google Sheet. So, um, you know, that's what I do. I download the information and then I sort um I sort the data by the average monthly search volume because I'm like a little kid in the candy shop and I, I'm just so excited when I have my keyword research and I can sort through it. And the first thing I want to do is see what the highest um, volume keywords are that people are using um, to identify um, the services and products that you know any client offers. I really want to really quickly kind of get to the bottom of whether they're already using the right terms on their site or if there's something altogether new and different and, and several new or different terms that we should be using. Um, and then so, you know, what, what we do is then walk through the highest volume keywords ideas together and determine which ones really are appropriate and relevant um, to an organization's particular products, services, and solutions. I mean, you don't wanna be using keywords in your website or on your website uh, page, uh, public facing content, or even in any of your behind the scenes tags, it, they're not really appropriate to your business because Google will ding you for that. Um, but the places you would employ your, your keywords um, that you've identified as being appropriate for you um, would be your website page content, 
And then what are called um, your page headers, um, they're referred to as H1 and H2, um, because Google will index those headers as well as your content. Um, and then there, there's what's called um, behind the scenes meta page title tags. Um, there's also uh, behind the scenes image tags that Google will call. So you can use your high volume keywords in those. You can, um, you can use your high volume keywords in an FAQ on your site. Let's say your site is small and you just don't have a lot of place, a lot of uh, space to put um, high volume keywords in, in relevant content. You could consider putting up an FAQ, frequently asked questions or continuing to write blog posts. Um, and then you can use um, the information you get from your keyword research to just inform the, the hashtags that you use in social media or to tag your YouTube videos. So keyword research has a lot of implications. It goes beyond just, um, you know, supporting your website being uh, found in search because it will help you figure out um, other aspects of your marketing. Like I said, tagging for social media or for YouTube, but also even help you figure out if people are really searching because if they are not, then, um, like I said, putting all this time and energy into a search engine optimization strategy probably isn't right for your business. Next slide. So um, just want to quickly show you um, the two most common types of organic listings. Um, since we're focusing on organic results versus um, paid search advertising, this is just an example of a listing with a link to my website that Google would serve up for um, digital marketing agency Braintree Mass, which is where um, I'm located. Um, the other type is what's called a Google My Business or Google Search and Maps listing. And that's what Google usually serves up for um, a near me search. So if someone says, um, how uh, winter lights near me, next slide. So on the left-hand side, we have what's, um, again, called your Google My Business Profile. Google recently started calling it your Google Search and Maps listing. But this one here is for the Bradley Estate, which is one of the organizations, um, one of the properties of the trustees of the reservation that's offering winter lights this season. And so you organic, an organic listing like this, like I said before, it tends to come up um when somebody's doing a near me search versus if somebody didn't put near me it might google might be more likely to serve up a listing to your website like the one i just showed for my own business and then what's shown on the right hand side here is what's called the local path and i'm sure you've all seen this um when you've done google searches but google will serve up what it considers to be the three best fits for somebody searching on relevant terms so you always want to come up um, for the appropriate ge geography for near me terms in this um, this local pack. And the, a lot of that is accomplished just through SEO tactics. So um, the other thing is I wanted to just mention while you're here, and this is just a this is just a marketing best practice, not necessarily related to, to SEO, but you do wanna think of your Google My Business profile as another form of social media. So um, once you have access to that, you should post to it as regularly as you do um, uh, any other form of social media. And actually, I mean, it does influence SEO because like your website, the more you keep your website current and you keep your Google My Business profile current, the more likely Google is to serve both up in uh, Google search results. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to show you how you can get access or create a Google My Business profile if you don't have one. Really, it's just a matter of typing your uh, address into uh, your browser or search engine, and you'll see um, something like this come up. And this shows examples for my business, but you'll see the red dot. And really what you have to do is just click on the red dot and then just follow the instructions to take ownership of the, uh, the Google Maps listing. Next slide. 
And um, this is an example of the footer of a website uh, that Robin and I have worked on together. Um, and we just wanted to show an example of what a geographic statement or description might look like that you can put in the footer of every page of your site to support being found in search. So this is for one of our clients, Lift and Care Systems, that offers durable medical equipment. They serve Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. So you'll see we called out those states there, and we even abbreviated the states because keep in mind, sometimes people will spell the state name out, sometimes they'll abbreviate it. And again, Google's not a mind reader or interpreter, so it's just crawling your site and grabbing what you tell it. And so even in the statement, we called out um, New England because some people might just search on New England or they might search on the Northeast. So you really have to think how people will be searching to find you. And then we also called out some of the key metro areas um, that this business serves. So again, you have to tell Google where you're located and where, um, what is the geography of um, the clients that you serve. Next slide. So this is our last um, SEO slide. And I just wanted to remind everybody, SEO is not a one and done activity. It is an ongoing uh, marketing tactic. It should be kept ongoing the way any other marketing tactics um, are kept going. Google is constantly changing its algorithm and what you need to do and can do to rank well in search. So, you know, you should be constantly using your keywords in new page content, um, new blog posts, new FAQs, but just um, continue to chip away at it. It is an ongoing thing. Um, there's all levels of work you can do. There's some initial things that are best practices, and we've talked a lot about the best practices, but there's other things that you can do. Um, I listed here a few more. You can submit your site map for indexing using what's called a Google Search Console account. You can use alt tags to tag photos. Um, again, you can create new blog posts and FAQs to, to continue to support your site ranking well. And then it's really, really important to try to include these types of links that I've listed here in your website content. So you wanna have internal links on your site, those are called inner page links or inner links. You want to link from one page of your site to another page. And that's also gonna keep people on your site longer um, and vis visiting more pages of your site. And then you want to have links to external credible sites. So you don't wanna make your site all about you the same way you don't wanna make your social media all about you. And so you do wanna um, offer resources to site visitors um, so that they can get additional information from other credible um, organizations about um, the, your topic in general. Um, and then the last thing is you do want to try to obtain what they call backlinks or links on other external credible sites to your site. And this gets very tricky. Um, you do not want to be buying backlinks. Do not, do not buy backlinks from someone that offers to sell you backlinks. You, you wanna get a backlink, but you wanna get that for free um, from some organization that you have a collaborative relationship with. For example, if you belong to a chamber of commerce or Rotary or um, some other association, you should be able to get a backlink from their site to your site, but you don't want to get in the habit of purchasing um, backlinks because many times they're not being sold by credible organizations. So. Um, that concludes our SEO discussion. Next slide. So we are here to help you slay your target audiences. So um, this is our contact information. I know Teresa is going to be sharing the slides with everybody. So you'll have access to our information um, after the presentation. But I guess we're going to open it up for questions now. Yeah, we do have some questions. Uh, I think this one's for Robert. Uh, excuse me for Robin. Uh, what do you know what the cost is for a SSL certificate? Yeah, so an SSL certificate is usually offered by your hosting company, and depending on which hosting company that you use, sometimes it's even free um, and a push button install. So it's super easy to do. Um, others do charge for your SSL certificate, but it's it's short money. It might be a hundred a year or something, um, but it's super important to have. Um, host company that I recommend to my clients is SiteGround and they provide a free SSL, 
which makes me feel happy because it means if I'm building a website there and I'm in shared hosting, it means all the other websites on my shared hosting also get that free SSL. So you don't have a, you know, a hacked website sitting right next to your website. So super important for security. Great. Um, how important is having an ADA compliant website? Is it worth the investment for a small company? So that's also a, probably a question for me because um, I do specialize in making ADA compliant websites. Um, and it and it's so it's it, it's so important to Google to have that ADA compliant. It helps tremendously with SEO. So Gail, Gail and I, you know, for working, especially for a client, we had Lifting Care who works in the ADA um, physical realm. Um, they provide services to people with disabilities to be able to get in and around their homes and and in their lives. Um, so we did that project and created an ADA compliant website. But in reality, if you did any business had an ADA compliant website, then they're doing so much better with SEO as well. Um, so think about, I, I think they say about 25% of your website visitors have some kind of disability at some point in their lives. So um, doing the extra effort, working with your web designer to also make it compliant um, will also um, help you get more customers that can work with you on your website. And then it also helps you, I mean, Google rewards you. So that's always good. Right. Yeah. Keep oh, in mind with your, with your current uh, projects that this is an option now, but in California, it's already mandatory. So it's coming down the pipe where if you don't have it, there are going to be ramifications for your site. Yeah. In Europe and, and other countries, it's um, 100% a law that you're, if you have a business website, it has to be compliant. Um, if as a consultant doing sessions with everyone online across the U.S., if on your Google My Business, we choose United States as the service area instead of a specific city state, what our SEOs suffer as a result compared to other consultants in one's vertical? Well, I always say if you try to rank everywhere, you're going to end up ranking nowhere. So it is very complicated because it's complicated when you serve the whole US. Um, partly because, I mean, your service area is what it is. So if it's a whole US, it's a whole US. And you certainly don't want to kind of lie in your Google My Business profile that you, um, you know, that, that you only serve one area. I mean, what you can do within your Google My Business profile, you're able to I forget how many it is, but it's a it's a fairly decent number of service areas. It may be um, maybe five to ten. It might actually even be more now because I think they keep increasing. But you can go in and pick service areas. So I I would have the location of your business be your primary or first service area, but then go in and pick other metropolitan areas in the U.S. that you serve. So if you tend to have a lot of clients, for example, on the West Coast, you could always pick you know, um, something on the West Coast, um, same thing, you might want to pick New York. So you, you do have that option. But ultimately, unfortunately, with your Google My Business profile, Google is going to serve up people that are more local, because that really is all about a near me search. I, I always feel like if you're a consultant offering services, you, you should have that Google My Business profile, just have it, it will support SEO, but don't count that Google's going to serve that up a lot. So I have a client on the Cape that's sort of a service business. Not many people put near me into a search engine related to the business they offer. So their Google My Business profile isn't getting served up well, but they can, they're still ranking, um, you know, they're still ranking decently for the whole US for terms they want to, but a lot of that is coming down to using the right um, keywords in their page style tags and the website content related to the services they offer. I hope that helps. Um, can uh, I ask the presenters to all put their contact info in chat? I've seen mm -hmm. a couple requests for that information, if you wouldn't mind. Um, the next question is, uh, if you only have a website with no physical retail store, can you still use Google My Business? You can and you should. Yes, you can and you should. Okay. Um, if I were to pay for a domain name and web host, does my choice of company I sign up with or type of plan I choose affect my SEO in any way? I uh, heard the speed of my website 
could be affected other ways based on um, our choice, which are your favorite? Um, so the, one of the first things we do when we work with a client, even in branding, um, and then at the end with uh, working with Steve to figure out the emails is having a really good domain name. If it's at all possible, having like a key term or a key phrase in that domain name, like web design by Robin, first it's web design. So that helps. Um, and I, what was the question about so the, speed? The, the, the two different parts to that, that okay. question. So the first part's the SEO. Uh, the second one, absolutely, depending upon which web package you oh, decide right. on, uh, is definitely going to affect your speed. So uh, you, you don't want to base your your answer or your, uh, your final output on cost. Uh, you want to take a look at all the variables. Cost is clearly an important one, but you also want to make sure the performance of your website. Robin can build a heck of a website, and Phil can provide some fantastic graphic work. If it takes a minute to load, then you've just wasted your time and you, you wasted want, your money. You want to, yeah, you want a really good um, hosting company and working with your website designer or your IT specialist to give recommendations um, is the is one place you can go. Um, but Phil can talk a little bit about where you can get um, that branding, get get what your what your primary services are into that branding and, and where it goes from there as far as, you know, that logo design, your taglines and your domain, your ultimately your emails. Yeah, you want all that done up front and you want to make sure that throughout the site and everything that goes out, it's consistent and it's accurate to what your business is. If you do everything like honestly, um, with good intentions, this is really what I do. This is really what I offer. You're gonna you're gonna have a much better starting point for SEO, <laughs> um, right, Gail? And and that's like the most important part when you're starting off on what you're gonna be doing and you're working with a score mentor is really determining what it is you really do, and then everything follows from there. And then you can. You can optimize on all of that. Um, would you say? Yeah, Deb? and I was. I wanted to say that, that your content management system, the the solution uh, you go with, and the platform on which your site is built does matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I might make some people on this call a little nervous by saying this, but I'm just going to say what I've observed all my years doing SEO work is that if you um, use a drag or drop technology website versus, um, you know, and that could be something like a, a Wix or Weebly or um, those are called drag and drop because you are dragging and dropping like um, like a section of your site. Like it's easy to lay it out and everything, but um, sometimes those sites, and it's also sometimes referred to as website builders. Sometimes those sites don't rank as well. So if you've got a bunch of competitors that have their site built on a platform like the one Robin uses, like Joomla or WordPress or Squarespace or something like that. Though those the, the code, the HTML code that's um, set up using those is it's much easier for Google to crawl and index. It's not bloated code. So my experience is that if your competitors are using those platforms and you're using something like a drag and drop platform. You, you're going to be at a disadvantage. That's what I've experienced anyway. I mean, there's arguments about that out there, whether it's true or not. But if someone's starting out and they don't already have a site, I always advise against using one of those because, yeah, maybe it costs you less to get started on one of those. But ultimately, from an SEO standpoint, you're not going to fare as well. Um, I have somebody asking about costs. Um, you know, what can they expect a four page website um, to cost versus a 12 page? I'm not sure if that's something you can give ranges on or not. It might be difficult. Yeah. Um, usually when you're talking to a web designer, um, their pricing can be anywhere from a couple thousand to a lot more than that. But you usually can go to their websites and get their pricing from their websites. And if you can't, you should contact them. Um, and ask them about pricing because um, ultimately you have to have the funds to do it and you want to make sm smart decisions 
Um, there is small business website packages, like someone just starting out, they want a five page website. Um, I work with like two different types of clients, those just starting out, just, you know, starting a business and they're usually um, working with some grant programs or working with mentors and they usually have a small website to start. And then the other type of client is someone who's been around in business for a long time and they need a makeover. And at that point, you know, they're generating a lot of business and their, their website is, is larger. They're, they're um, selling more things, they're offering more services. And so there's more pages. Um, and so that, that pricing would be more because there's more to it. Um, but you know, those, those prices, it's a, it's a large range as to how much it's gonna cost. But ultimately, if you spend the time to do it and you do it right from the beginning, you'll save yourself time and money later on trying to switch from a, a freebie website done by your brother-in-law to someone who professionally works in web design. And working with um, a web designer, they usually like build a team. So I, I build it, I know a lot of the panelists here mentioned that they've worked with me, um, but my clients come to me with all different types of needs. And depending on those needs, you usually, you know, work with specialists like ourselves and, and, and only, you know, only use the services that you need. So you're not paying for everything, like if you went to an agency, which is nice. Um, every business is different. So depending on what you need, um, you should be able to have people to work with that can give you exactly what you need. Okay, uh, I think we're going to have to make this our last question. Um, I want to be able to add content to my website regularly and have the blog and articles attached, but I don't want to use like a drag and drop. What compromise can I reach with my designer, the web designer? Take it away, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you're having your website designed in a content management system, which is very, very common these days, um, your, once your website is launched, your website designer should give you instructions on how to go in and do it, all the things that you want to do. Um, and that includes writing new articles, and those are what you, what you would put into a blog, and having them automatically posted to your website. And then from there, you can share them on your social media, in your emails, and other things. So you should, if it's one of the questions you should ask if you're looking for a website designer, can I or some, someone who works with me, my staff members, be able to make the changes I wanna make on a regular basis. Because I mentioned that in my presentation, you wanna be able to do it on your schedule and, you, and you're already paying someone in your office or, doing, or put, putting aside time for you to do it, you wanna be able to do it and save that money. Um, so content management systems allow you to do that. So, there's, so you really wanna make sure that the, the web designer you use you use takes the extra steps to train you on how to do that because it's totally possible with content management systems. And just a quick add on to that, um, just be very uh, leery when you're uh, pricing out web, websites, web hosts and web design, um, because you can go to a low cost uh, that you know may make a nice site for you, but at the end of the day, you may not have, uh, or you may not own the content of that website. So when you decide, you need a more robust site or you want to improve your site, you realize that they now own everything that you work very hard on uh, over the years and you may have to start from scratch. So that that's just something to keep in the back of your mind uh, when, when looking for the different services and also looking at the different prices. Uh, buyer beware, make, make sure you know what you're signing up for because you may end up losing your, your hard work and you have to start all over again and, and start that cost meter all over again. Yeah, definitely make sure that you purchase the domain name, you purchase the hosting, you purchase the email. You can have all of us help you set it up and get it running, but make sure it's all in your name because you really want to be able to have ownership of all of that material. And a lot of times clients come to us and they're like, I, I don't have ownership. I don't know where it is. And our first steps is... Um, private investigation, finding out where it is and getting it back for you. And that's such a hassle and um, a reputable website designer will give you that ownership that you, I mean, it's your business. It's your yeah. property. That's a painful process when we get to get to that uh, discovery phase. <laughs> yeah. It can take an awful long time just to find out where it is and then to gain access to it again, uh, either impossible sometimes or it takes an awful lot of time and, and uh, a, a lot of gray hair. Well, thanks, guys. That's that's a great, 
great place to stop. That was a great piece of advice that I hope everyone heard. Um, I want to thank our presenters today. I know a ton of information was um, presented that was is going to be very useful to all of you attending. And please check out the recording if you want to uh, watch that again. And I believe they, they put all their contact information in chat. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.